This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on insurance. Today I'd like to speak about the Ballard Allison case that brought about after a decision of a trial court thousands of lawsuits claiming damages due to mold fungi. The fear of mold claims was engendered into the insurance industry by the trial court decision in a case called Ballard v. Fire Insurance Exchange, which was cited in jury awards as a $32 million judgment to a Texas homeowner in a mold coverage action. What coverage attorneys need to know about mold became something that was in every legal journal. Every journal followed by tort lawyers because it seemed like such an easy way to get a great deal of money out of an insurance company. What they didn't know, and what eventually happened was that the Texas Court of Appeals at Austin reversed much of the trial court's opinion in a case called Ronald Allison Fire Insurance Exchange versus Fire Insurance Exchange, a 2002 decision of the appellate court that explained the factual background that resulted in an improper and excessive judgment against the fire insurance exchange. The Court of Appeals described the evidence presented at trial in detail necessary to the understanding of the decision. Although the Ballard-Allison trial verdict was touted as a mold claim, it was, in fact, a claims handling case. The jury, hearing the evidence of Mr. and Mrs. Allison's claim for damage to their property, were offended by the admission of the adjuster, of Ms. McConnell, who admitted she lied to the insured, the Allisons, and decided, therefore, to punish the insurer with excessive punitive damages. In order to avoid an insurance claim as complex as this one, the fire insurance exchange should have followed proper claims handling protocol. The lawsuit and the results of the lawsuit could have been avoided if it followed good faith claims handling practices and if the claims adjuster did not testify that she lied to the insureds. If the Ballard claim was presented after the decision in Feiss versus State Farm Lloyds, there would have been no coverage for any of her claims except the direct damage caused by water and no basis for allegations of bad faith. But the politics of it, the news of it, resulted in hundreds if not thousands of mold claim lawsuits claiming bodily injuries, property damage as a result of molds. Well, what is mold? The term mold is, a def is defined as a simple microscopic organism that's found everywhere, indoors and outdoors. Mold belongs to the fungi kingdom. All molds are fungi, but not all fungi are molds. Like mushrooms, most molds consist of a fruiting body, a root system, and very small seeds known as spores. The filaments are the root system that microfungi send into whatever material they are growing on 
so that they can soften and digest the material. Mold is everywhere. It is a living thing that is neither animal nor what is usually considered a plant. It grows naturally outdoors. The spores which mold create in order to reproduce are present in the air. When mold moves indoors, it grows rapidly in environments that contain an excessive amount of moisture. Homeowners unintentionally create good conditions for mold growth through moisture collected from a leaky roof, broken pipe, clogged drainage systems, or lack of waterproofing materials in a shower stall. Any one of these things can initiate the process of mold growth. In addition to the presence of moisture, Mold needs a nutrient source to develop and spread. The necessary nutrients are present in most homes and commercial structures. Nutrients that are consumed by molds include wallpaper, cardboard, ceiling tiles, wood, wood products, newspapers, carpeting, or any product containing cellulose. Many molds are benign. Some are edible, such as mushrooms and the fungi that convert milk to cheese. Other molds, called mycotoxins, are claimed to produce toxins harmful to human health. Microtoxins can be absorbed into the human body through the intestinal lining, airway paths, and skin. Human exposure to mold can be very dangerous. And sometimes it's not dangerous at all. It's basically delicious. Mycologists, scientists dealing with mold, have estimated that there are hundreds of thousands of species of mold, each having its own preference for moisture, temperature, and food source. Mold grows on all live plants, dead plants, animal matter, and in soil. Spores are blown about by the wind and are almost always found in indoor and outdoor air. They are a normal component of house dust. The label toxic mold is misleading. Mold is not in itself toxic. Although some molds produce mycotoxins that have the toxic effect attributed to mold, molds are generally only life-threatening to infants, the elderly, or the infirm. No specific mold is always dangerous or always harmless. Mold allergies are not rare. In fact, some with a severe mold allergy may be worse off being exposed to an allergenic mold than a healthy person would be after being exposed to a so-called toxic mold. In a case called Voorhees v. Uber, a 2010 decision of the District Court, Western District of Kentucky, it was determined that one cannot maintain a cause of action by speculation. Voorhees speculated that mold in the sleeping area of his jail cell could be endangering his health. The plaintiff did not cite any symptoms that he experienced related to breathing the mold, such as coughing, allergies, headaches, etc. The court ruled that a speculative injury does not vest a plaintiff with standing. Now, mold exists in a variety of forms, including the following. Aspergillus. Members of molds of this type are known for their ability to initiate the onset of allergies in humans as well as upper respiratory infections. The genus Aspergillus includes over 185 species. Around 20 species have so far been reported as causative agents of opportunistic infections in man. 
Among these, the most commonly isolated species are Aspergillus flavus and Aspergillus niger. Species of Aspergillus clavatus, glaucus, nidulans, orase, teres, ustus, and versicolor are less commonly as isolated as opportunistic pathogens. Aspergillus is a group of molds found worldwide, especially in the northern hemisphere during autumn and winter. The fungus also causes allergic diseases in asthmatics and patients suffering from cystic fibrosis. Some produce mycotoxins that are carcinogen in animals. Then there's cladosporium, the most commonly identified outdoor fungus. Cladosporium is a common allergen in humans. Colonies are dark greenish to black and relatively slow growing. The dark spores are one or two celled and occur in long branching chains that arise from a dark conidiophore. The youngest form is at the top of the chain. The slightest movement will disrupt the chains, making microscopic mounts of the whole structure nearly impossible. Then there's penicillin, the mold that gave us the great antibiotic, penicillin. Penicillin may cause hypersensitivity and pneumonia-like diseases as well as respiratory and skin allergies. Species of penicillium are recognized by their dense brush-like spore-bearing structures. And, of course, there is the so-called evil stachybotrys, a greenish-black fungus that grows on material with a high cellulose and low nitrogen content, such as fiberboard, gypsum board, paper dust, and lint, that becomes chronically moist or water-damaged due to excessive humidity, water leaks, condensation, water infiltration, or flooding. No one knows how this fungus is found since buildings are not routinely tested for its presence. However, one study in Southern California found it in 2.9% of 68 homes. It seems to show up a lot and is the basis of many lawsuits. In Housing Authority of Baltimore versus Roy, the Maryland Court of Appeal found that the testimony of a physician was sufficient to permit a finding by a jury that there was a cause and effect relationship between the stachybotrys mold conditions at the property and the medical problems suffered by its residents. Yet in Henley versus Fairgrove, a 2008 decision of the Missouri Court of Appeal, the court found the plaintiff failed to carry the burden of proving causation from exposure to mold. However, when a person claims illness or injury from mold, individuals with persistent health problems that appear to be related to fungi or other bioaerosol exposure should see their physicians for a referral to practitioners who are trained in occupational environmental medicine or related specialties and are knowledge about these types of exposure. Clinical tests that can determine the source, place, or time of exposure to fungi or their pro byproducts are not currently available. Antibodies developed by exposed persons to fungal agents can only document that exposure has occurred, since exposure to fungi routinely occurs in both outdoor and indoor environment. This information is of limited value. The scientific and medical evidence is inconclusive on how exposure to molds in indoor environments may affect patients' overall well-being and health. 
However, there is a developing body of literature documenting specific effects of mold on respiratory disease. Recent publications explore effects of mold exposure on allergic sensitization and asthma severity. In addition, patients present with irritant symptoms and a broad array of possible toxic effects that include neuropsychiatric cognitive deficits and digestive system problems that some researchers and clinicians have noted could be associated with mold exposure. Patients may have their own anecdotes and perceived symptoms, or they may be responding to alarming notices in the lay media. The, the review by a group of scientists provided the reader with context for discussing the risk with the patient as well as suggesting resources for patients who want to address mold and moisture in their homes, schools, and building environments. After reviewing case studies, the reports showed that the fungi can cause disease in humans and animals by a variety of biological mechanisms, but there is no scientific basis for using the term toxic mold. As the U.S. Center for Disease Control concluded, the term toxic mold is not accurate. While certain molds may be toxigenic, meaning they can produce toxins, specifically microtoxins, the molds themselves are not toxic or poisonous. Hazardous, hazards presented by molds that may produce mycotoxins should be considered the same as other common molds which can grow in your house. There is always a little mold everywhere, in the air. And on many surfaces, there are very few reports that toxigenic molds found inside homes can cause unique or rare health conditions, such as pulmonary hemorrhage or memory loss. These case reports are rare and a causal link between the presence of the toxigenic mold and these conditions has not been proven. Although there are many anecdotes that indicate that there is such a thing as toxic mold, a group of anecdotes is only evidence of the anecdote, not evidence of toxicity of mold or mold spores. So it is important to do a thorough investigation before making such a claim as causing bodily injury. This video was adapted from my book, The Mold and Fungi Handbook, which is available as both a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com. Please, if you found this video to be interesting or useful to your colleagues, pass it on. It's free. And please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, by cl and click on the like button or my rumble channel clicking on the rumble button to show your appreciation and also subscribe to my blog my substack publications and to my publications on locals.com thank you for your attention